Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Welcome to the Performance Matters podcast from GP Strategies, your workforce transformation partner. In each episode, we'll interview industry experts and explore best practices and innovative insights to help your organization improve performance. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Michael Thiel. I'm a creative director serving within the innovation team at GP Strategies. And beyond that, I'm a longtime follower of the Performance Matters podcast. It's been a companion of mine during drive time commutes. And right now, today, I'm absolutely thrilled to be a first time host. And we've got a great, great show for you today. Today's topic is incredibly timely, incredibly relevant, and what we're calling it is shift the culture through continuous learning. And here to riff with us on this subject is our very own Cheryl L. Jackson, comma, PhD. Hello, Cheryl, how are you? Hey, I'm doing so well, how are you? (laughs) I'm doing great, so I'm dying to ask you this. Can I call you Dr. Jackson, is that okay? I would love it. (laughs) <laughs> I was gonna say, if I had a PhD, I'm and I'm I'm out at Applebee's having a big night. I'd be like, yeah, um, Dr. Jackson will have the Bourbon Street steak and the Oreo shake. You know what I'm talking about? So you know, I tell my students, you don't have to, but you definitely get extra points if you do. <laughs> I love it. Okay, cool. So just to let everyone know, Cheryl is officially, this is her title, is she's an organizational design and change practice lead here at GP Strategies. And yeah, I mean, we're honored to have you carve out time here. So before we get started, though, and Cheryl's far too humble to do this, but I just want to establish some of her bona fides for you if you're out there driving and you're like, okay, what does Cheryl have to offer when it comes to this topic of shift the culture through continuous learning? So uh, again, Cheryl, you don't have to brag. You can slip me 10 bucks later if you want to. But here's the scoop. So Cheryl has a, a legit PhD in industrial and organizational psychology. And I got to be honest, I did a little LinkedIn stalking. I don't know if anyone else has ever done that before. You might want to check out LinkedIn. It's kind of a cool new website. But uh, in all seriousness, I mean, I was pretty blown away with Cheryl's background. She has not in addition to consulting and being a professor, she's consulted with some of the most admired brands in the world. So tiny little companies, I don't know if you've heard of like Starbucks, Home Depot, Lowe's, Kimberly Clark, you know, really heavy hitters out there. She is credentialed with the the Society for Human Resource Management. And the last thing I want to say on her credentials here to build her up is I loved her why statement on her LinkedIn profile. And if you don't know what that is, that's a little statement that you stick right underneath your name. And it was uh, IO practitioner changing the world one engaged employee at a time. I love that, Cheryl. Share us a little background about that. That was just very inspirational for me. Oh, thank you for noticing that. Um, I, I take so much joy in helping people be more satisfied at work and not because work is just so important, which it is, but because the way you feel about work spills over into every area of life. And what we know is that when people are more satisfied at work, when they're happy, when they're engaged, they're more engaged at home and they're more engaged in their communities and they're more engaged with their families. And that's how we really make a difference in their work life and their home life is by picking an area that we can impact. And as an employer, as managers, as leaders, we can impact their work life. So why don't we do that? And that's the way we we really change their lives for the better. I love it. I love it. It's so inspirational. And You know, one of the things that we're talking about today is probably one of the most, I'd say, multifaceted and challenging aspects of workforce transformation, and that's culture, shifting that culture um, through things like continuous learning. And and in the buildup for this, in in the cross communications we've had, I know I've been traveling, you've been out and about working with clients. One of the things that was very interesting to me was this that you had mentioned that um, one of the holy grails of of, uh, learning and development, which is just-in-time learning, which is delivering learning at the moment of need, might not be the right fit when looking to support cultural change in organizations. So I wanted to start this out there because, you know, that's been my thing is really trying to deliver content in the moment of need. So can you just share a little bit? That really caught my eye and, and tripped me up a little bit. I want to know more about it and maybe take a couple notes, get a free counseling session, if that's okay, Cheryl. 
Absolutely. You know, one of the things when we come into challenge and struggle within an organization, the first thing we often turn to is we need to train these people. We need to upskill them so that they have the capability to do this new thing that we're implementing or to behave in a new way. And we call that training. And training is very passive. That is something that is happening to us. We're attending training. We were trained. A a trainer comes in and delivers this information. And so we have seen this shift toward using the term learning more. Learning is active. I am learning. I'm a learner. I'm doing something um, that is really engaging my brain and I'm taking it. I'm Um, integrating with what I know, I'm creating something different, and I'm going to apply that in a meaningful way. Uh, But we still tend to use those terms interchangeably. So you may still hear people using both terms, but I like that we're really focusing on learning, uh, which still begs the question of the difference between just in time and this continuous. So oftentimes we put uh, the learning piece of that at the last minute. It is like we do all of this great planning and then we say, okay, now let's get everyone up to speed. And here we go. We we throw that out there. Why do we need to do it ahead of time when they may forget? Uh, our processes aren't in place to really engage them in that way yet. We need it to be just in time. When you're learning to use a cash register, you understand the way, you know, in a, my one of my first jobs, my parents were small business owners. So that was technically my first, um, but I worked at a fast food restaurant and I learned all about the organization and their values and when they open and when they close. And right before I went out on the floor, I learned how to use the cash register. If they had taught <laughs> me that first, I I may not have remembered when it was time. So there is definitely a time and place for just in time. Um, But when we think about culture change, there's really not a just in time. That is a significant shift that takes a long time or any type of change within the organization that's outside of push this button instead of that button. Uh, We want to do more than throw it at the last minute. There's no real just in time for that type of change. So, I hear that, and it sounds like Just In Time has a role. Um, In terms of, let's just think about even backpedaling back to that first job when it comes to building that culture. What are some of those best practices that, that you would say an organization should be thinking about when looking at rolling out a, a cultural change then? Kind of those foundational stepping stones. <laughs> Well, as an industrial psychologist, I like to take you back to the beginning and say you hire people that have the skills, the abilities, the values um, that you really value and that are going to lay a foundation to be change adept and say, I I embrace change. But we're not there. You know, say we're we're working with the workforce that we have. We want to start developing our workforce to say, hey, something is coming. We want you in the right mindset. We want you to understand your own resistance to change. Uh, Positive psychology, which is something I'm super passionate about, is kind of taking um, this mediocre level of satisfaction for life um, to increase it. So how do we take those that are just medium disengaged or or have medium inability to change and really increase that and say, let's just improve that level. And so we want to get everybody in the organization lifted up from an internal perspective, preparedness for change, adaptability, and really building some of those what in HR we call that soft skills of foundational um, foundational skills that are going to make any change better. Uh, it's like state versus trait. Just in time learning is kind of the state approach versus this trait approach of this is who I am. I am ready for change. I in- embrace the opportunity to do things differently. I am optimistic as opposed to pessimistic. And these are things that we can develop within our workforce, but you cannot do that just in time. You have to start thinking about that ahead of time. And whether or not you see change on the horizon, you can start developing this within your workforce, starting with leadership and making sure your leadership understands the tenets of engagement, optimism, flexibility, and adaptability, and start to build that into their workforce 
all the way through the organization. And when you're faced with change in the future, you're already going to have a leg up on those that have not engaged in building those foundational skills within their workforce. That is great information, Dr. Cheryl. And if you don't mind, I might have to steal that state versus trade. I don't know if you have patented that one yet, but I'm about to. I love that. That's a great <laughs> thing to think about. So what I'm hearing you're saying is apart from the continuous learning, if you're looking mm -hmm. to shift the culture, you really need to start quite a bit earlier than anyone yes. might ever imagine. Is that a fair assessment? 100% accurate way before right. you're even thinking about this. But if you see change on the horizon, jump to it first thing. Before you put your project plan together, before you start gathering resources and creating all of these um, bylaws and process <laughs> mapping and all of those things that we spend so much energy doing, say, how can we start preparing and readying our workforce to be able to handle this change 12, 18 months, five years down the road? That's sage advice. And also myself being a creative director, typically I've come in on a cultural change when it's, hey, let's create an amazing road show or, you know, uh, the big launch event type thing. You're saying you want to have people uh, being e at least receiving some of that message even before they would come to something like that, like the shock and awe event. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, like when you're thinking about launching a new product, we, we understand how social media works. An influencer gets on there. They start talking about it. They build up. They start building up why this is important. Why are we even thinking about this? What struggles are you facing right now that we're not even telling you we're about to address? But I'm making you aware of the difficulties, of the challenges, of the inefficiencies of our current way of thinking. So I'm already like, yeah, you're right. This is challenging. Oh, there, there might be a better way to do this. And you're like leading me all the way along, preparing me for what you're going to drop when you launch this product or when you tell me what great new thing that you've been doing. Uh, and that's how we operate in change. We start readying it. We don't want to just suddenly be like, boom, new color palette, new values, new behaviors. We start filtering those in so it's not so new. We do not like new as human beings. Um, our you know, reptilian brain says new is bad. It's dangerous. I don't know them. I don't know if they're going to come wipe out everything I know and love. So I'm going to reject that. And we still operate in that, whether we want to or not, whether we say, I love change. We still have some internal resistance that we have to fight with because that's part of our makeup and who we are. So as we start to uh, think about our values before we launch and say we have these great new values, we start talking about them. We start sharing them top down. We start using those words so they're not new. I've heard this before. I can't tell you when I started hearing it, but it has just become part of my vocabulary. It's become part of our identity as an organization. So when we lay out these this new value system, it's not like a, a 180 turn. It's just, oh, now you're giving me a framework for what we've already been talking about. And the resistance is much less. That is a continual process. You've got to start laying the groundwork long before you put them in a classroom and say, let me give you the definitions of our new values. You you are really bringing a lot of insight here to me, truly, because this almost sounds like that old analogy of, you know, if you slow and I don't mean turn up the heat in a bad way. But, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you put a frog in a pot, I think that's what it sounds like. I might I might have to sound real Southern or something when I say that, but you know, if, yeah. if you, if you just turn up that a little bit slowly, it stays in the pot. Right. But if you try to drop it in real quickly, it's, it's going to reject it. And you know, that's probably a terrible analogy. We'll probably cut that from the podcast, <laughs> but, but you're, you know, the, what you're saying, and I've been doing this now for 20 years, various, various clients, you know, cultural change initiatives and what you're saying is something I've seen as an X factor that's really not been there a lot. Usually it's let's have a big reveal, ta-da, and then folks are going, wow, we're dealing with a lot of aftermath. There's pushback and everything. So this uh, this alone is good. I think we can just cut the podcast right now. We're all done. Perfect, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you so much. We don't want to give too much value to our clients. So oh, heaven no. <laughs> I know I want to circle back to a second element here, and that is because, again, I, I deal not so much with the cultural change all the time, but um, it's this idea of 
learning in the moment of need or just in time learning. So at the beginning, we mentioned it might not be the right tool for the job in terms of implementing for a cultural change. But when would a just in time learning suite of tools be the right tool for the job? What are some examples? Yeah, so in change, we have uh, two big buckets of change. One is kind of this transactional change where I'm just we're, pu- we're putting in a new system. You've got to go to this website instead of this website. You need to call this phone number for HR help instead of talking to this person. We've got just steps that you need to change. Yes, there's some resistance there, but I'm not having to change my heart and my mind and how I feel about it. Your opinion doesn't matter. This was cheaper. This is the way we're going. Right? And then there's transactional change, which is, gosh, I need in the dark when nobody's looking and it's easier for me to do it this way. That's probably what I'm going to do now with the transactional change. It doesn't matter if my manager is looking at me or not. The other website doesn't work anymore. If I don't push this button to give someone a medium size lemonade, then they're not going to get a medium lemonade. Uh, Thinking back to the cash register analogy. So just in time training and, and even transformational changes still have an element of just in time learning when we need to give them tools and resources to do something differently. We want to tackle the mind first and then move into the the skills. So when they need to do a new skill um, or follow a new process or apply something very quickly, this is when that just in time learning is great because they are going to pr- uh, learn it and they're going to practice it learn it, practice it. And that is critical to making it stick. You know, if we don't have that middle link, it it starts to fade. Uh, We have to practice that. I don't know if you took a foreign language in high school or middle school. I sure (laughs) did. And I couldn't, you know, I didn't use, I have not used it. And so it has faded. Um, But in the moment I could ask you where the bathroom was. Now I would have to stop and think about that. When you're in the middle of change or getting people to do something new, you don't want them to have to stop and think about it. You want them to practice, practice, practice. And that's how we create habits. Uh, That's how it becomes part of their behavior. So just-in-time learning is very good in those situations where they're going to practice it right now. We want you to do something differently. Follow this new process. Ask questions in this way. Practice it, and it becomes more a part of their behavior. Got it. So it sounds like you're saying let's win hearts and minds using other tools in terms of making the the changes more of the, the cultural norm, the new norm, not making it dramatic. And then in those moments of need, let's make it easy to access real time support, whether it's learning and development, software overlays, you know, the myriad elements that we have within our tool chest here at GP Strategy. So In terms of the environment, I mean, we've talked a lot about tools and about people, but in terms of the environment, uh, overall, in your mind and from your experience, what role does the environment play beyond the learning in itself as it pertains to shifting the culture? Yeah, one thing that we do not think about very often when we implement any kind of new learning experience is what happens after that. Um, How is that learning supported within the environment? And as leaders, we have to think about that. We can't just send our our team and send them to this way. Oh, the the training department's going to fix that. The facilitators (laughs) are going to teach them everything they need and they're going to come back and they're going to be able to do all of these new things. We have to support that learning experience for the next many, many months and oftentimes many, many years until it has developed a pattern, a habit, a behavior change. And so the environment is critical. Uh, I am a mom of two boys and they are four and six right now, but I know there's going to be the day where they're not around me as much as they're around their peers. And that is terrifying for many parents. (laughs) Why is that? Because you can teach them the values you want, the behaviors you want them to display, the, the way they feel about themselves and talk positively about themselves. But as soon as they're out there surrounded by their peers more than they're surrounded by you, that environment is going to influence how they behave and how they exhibit 
all the things that you have taught them up to that point, and it can start to erode. All parents know you have to keep pushing those behaviors through those teen years uh, the way you want them to behave. Otherwise, they'll, they could lose it and be more influenced by their peers. It's the same way in the learning environment. We have to build an environment where they can practice those behaviors. Oftentimes, we, we put this, hey, L&D group, go out there, create this new system and this training program, fix all of these things, but we're not going to change anything about how our employees are incentivized. The leader behaviors, are we encouraging them to engage in this new process? Um, are we talking about it? Are we using those same words? Because what's going to happen is they have built a rut in their brain. Think about if you live in a snowy climate, uh, you have tire tracks. And the more they go through, one car follows the next and you you build these ruts in the snow. The next yeah. tire, the next car that comes along, if they're not in those ruts, it's very difficult for them to maneuver. And oftentimes they end up in the ruts and driving through, which creates this safe pattern if you're in a car at some point. But if that rut is going in the wrong direction, you're going in the wrong path right along with it. And it's very hard to get out. We do the same thing in, with our brains. We build these connections and we fall into what's comfortable. So if our leaders aren't constantly reinforcing that, if our performance review system and our merit and our review process is not currently reinforcing that, we're going to fall back into the old ruts. No matter how good the learning program was, it could be the most immersive experience that was ever developed. But if your system does not support it, they will fall back into the ruts because it's easier. It's safer. That's what got them advanced to this point. You know, why would they do something different that hasn't been proven that their managers are not encouraging? So we have to continue that learning experience with the environment that supports it. And that is critical. And it's a piece, an element that we often overlook. We think we're done. You know, we're here. Ta -da. Come, come to be fresh <laughs> learners and you know, they're still in those old ruts. We got to get them out. I love it. I love it. That's great advice. I mean, so far we've covered really the almost the the beginning and end of this topic here in terms of shifting that culture through continuous learning, thinking about the overall program, how you need to roll that out and normalize first, how to use just in time tools once you've implemented a program to make it easy for learners to transform and have real-time access to information to help them along the way. And then in terms of the environment and really thinking what's next is really thinking, as you mentioned, for years beyond that, not even just, hey, what's a week after this big cultural change and what's out there? So who are the, the key constituents that we need to be thinking about? If, you, if you're putting together a little framework, who are the key constituents part of that would really comprise that environment in your mind, Dr. Cheryl? Uh, sponsors are a critical piece of change. We talk about sponsor engagement throughout the change process a lot. So from top down, the highest level you can possibly engage is the best. So they learners and and even leaders themselves need to know that their top leadership, starting with the CEO, is on board with this initiative, that they're supportive of it, and that they're going to make sure that their leaders are uh, fulfilling this change that we want to fulfill. Do they care about it? Because all I care about is a promotion, my next step, I want to have job security, I'm not going to do anything to shake that. So I need to know my highest level leadership is on board with that. All the way down, you know, the middle level leadership is important. The more exposure that you have to that leader, um, the more relevant they are to you. But your next two levels of leaders are just critical in making any type of change stick. They're the ones engaging with you the most. They're the ones that are going to advocate for you or not. And if your leader is struggling with you at all, we all know they're not going to advocate for us as much as they may <laughs> advocate for someone that uh, is going along with what they're thinking that doesn't ruffle any feathers in a way. So we want to make sure that this new way of learning does not create obstacles for the person that's trying to engage in it or uh, this new culture and environment that we're trying to build. So that the leadership is just such an important factor in making sure that whatever we put out there really has a, an effect that it fits into the change environment. 
Oh, that's great stuff. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So just to put a bow on this, we have had a real nice knowledge drop. I have a legal pad full of chicken scratches here. I type all the time, but I've gotten some real gold here for myself from state versus trait, ready and for change, make it not new, avoiding the ruts. There's all kinds of great things in here. Um, Cheryl, if you have any parting thoughts, I've got one last question for you here. And if you just had to say one last thing here before we ended this podcast, and it's just the biggest question is why is continuous learning so important for culture change? Let's just end with that question. You know, culture is constantly evolving and we have to constantly evolve with it or we'll slip back into what's safe, what's comfortable and what I know. And when we have a lot of individuals going around doing their own thing and following um, what they know and what they're comfortable with, we don't have the cohesion that we really need for a successful um, culture shift. So we have to keep speaking the same language, talking about the same things. It's not about group think, but it's about understanding and having a sense of appreciation for what we're all here doing together. And I do have two takeaways that I would love to share when we talk about this continuous learning effect. It's it's not um, just about learning experiences. Leaders have the most powerful impact on this continuous learning because they're the ones that are taking that learning and driving it into the future. They're not wiping their hands of it. They're probably the most important part of a learning and development organization because they're the ones talking to that employee constantly reinforcing these things. And so to make a learning initiative or a change stick, make it easy to engage in those new behaviors and hard to engage in the old old ones. You know, take the websites away completely. Take those behaviors away. <laughs> Have constant check-ins that say, are we on the right path? And then two, make it rewarding to behave in that new way and not rewarding, or some would say, punishing you a punishment if they engage in the old ways. The last thing we want is to continue to promote people that are engaging counter to the new behaviors. And we hear that all the time within organizations and it creates such a conflict between the people trying to do the new behaviors and those still clinging to the old. On behalf of the entire population driving and listening here, Cheryl, thank you so much for joining and uh, yeah, thanks so much and have a great day. Thanks for having me. The Performance Matters Podcast is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get podcasts or listen on our website at gpstrategies.com.